Well, um, this being a session on climate change, I am going to at least try to put my talk into a climate context. So, first of all, I just should acknowledge my co-author here, Mark Ritchie. Let's see, make sure I go the right way. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen this particular graph showing the areas burned in the western states over time. And this distinct jump you see after the 1970s is probably, a lot of it probably is due to uh, exclusion of fire, long-term exclusion, and buildup of fuels. But during this time, uh, climate's also warmed. A snowpack is less. And uh, so fire seasons have lengthened. And so it's un un undoubtedly true that as the climate warms, we're gonna see more fire. I should also point out that historically, uh, we probably, the mountain fire was probably up here somewhere, so it still pales in comparison to what you, the, our ecosystems used to experience. But as lovers of plants, we should probably be more concerned about how fires burn than if it burns, because fire's not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to uh, ecosystems. It's just that a lot of our forested ecosystems these days have gotten to the point with the exclusion of fire uh, that uh, a lot of them have uh, way too many trees, a lot more than they used to, uh, high surface fuel loads, and in combination with uh, uh, climatic conditions, um, we see more high severity fire than in a lot of areas that we'd like to, at least at, at larger spatial scales. And this is the case uh, with the fire I'm going to talk about today. It's the Cone Fire, which occurred on the Lassen National Forest in the Blacks Mountain Experimental Forest in 2002, and in areas that hadn't been thinned and had no prescribed fire, uh, this is a, a lot, what a lot of it looked like after the fire. So then the uh, management dilemma is, well, what do you do with all the standing dead snags? And one option is to salvage some of the uh, lumber. Uh, another option is to uh, leave the forest to recover undisturbed. And salvage logging has obviously been it's a very controversial and polarizing topic. And in terms of the understory vegetation, one of the concerns is that if you have multiple sequential disturbances, one severe disturbance following another, that you could potentially put the ecosystem over a tipping point and cause the, really set back the recovery uh, more than either of the disturbances by itself. So this being an experimental forest, uh, we decided to set up an experiment. And this is an area uh, that burned at high severity. And we, we installed a, a, a whole gradient of salvage intensities from 0% retained to 100% retained by basal area or the cross section area of stem with three intermediate levels. And these were our targets. Uh, by you know, percentage retention, we didn't quite meet those targets, but we, we do, do have a gradient of salvage intensities, and we have three replications of each of those treatments. And this was all um, installed in October, November of 2003, so a little over a year after the fire. And the, the study was initially set up to look at fuel succession over time, but we thought it was a good opportunity to also look at the understory, so we wanted to ask a couple of questions, one being, what is the overall effect of salvage logging on the understory plant community? And secondly, uh, anytime you have a disturbance, there's a concern about invasion of non-native species, and so we wanted to look at whether salvage logging promotes invasion. Uh, so it's pretty easy uh, study and sampling design. All we basically did is, is put a bunch of quad rods out on a systematic grid, and, but then we went in and we looked at the cover of each species in our quadrats in 2006, 2008, 2010, and 2012 to really look at the uh, recovery over time. And I'll jump right into what we found. Uh, here is the, the cover of plants by growth form. And here's the Forbes. And just to orient you, um, here are the three, I mean, the five salvage treatments. And this is the salvage intensity. 0% retained means 100% salvaged. And what we saw for Forbes is there was no significant difference in cover. 
among those treatments. There's the same number, uh, same cover of orbs across all of those treatments. But over time, uh, there was a significant decline from 2006 to 2012. For graminoids, which are the, where I'm considering here the grasses and the sedges, uh, again, we saw no significant difference in graminoid cover over those treatments. Same in each of them, but in this case, they are increasing over time. Shrubs, a little bit different story here. Uh, we actually saw an effect of salvage on shrubs with uh, re reduced shrub cover in the more heavily salvaged treatments. And I'll give you some ideas for why that might be in a later slide. Uh, and the shrub cover is, is increasing over time. So just because this is a plant audience and you probably just don't want to see plant groups, uh, I thought I'd show how the community has changed over time. It illustrates uh, a lot of what was in the past slide, uh, but I don't know how well you can all see that out here. Uh, basically, I've, I've, uh, the forbs are here in purple, and the, the forbs generally decreased over time. Here's three. Uh, annual forb species, Gaophyta, Cretantha, Kalinzia, they decreased the most. Uh, three uh, perennial forbs uh, decreased less. Uh, the, the grasses shown here in, in orange all increased over time, and as well as the shrubs. And our, our most common species on the site was a Ceanothus prostratus. It's prostrate Ceanothus. You can see it growing in the foreground here. So this next slide shows uh, plant diversity by native and non-native species. And diversity here is represented just by a count of number of species of richness. And again, with, for the native species, there was the same number of native species in each of the salvage treatments. Uh, there was just a drop in 2012, and I think that's probably due to the, the drought and the loss of some of the um, the annual uh, orbs. And then this, the, the bottom here are the non-native species, and it's kind of a, a little bit of a broken record here, but again, no significant difference between the salvage treatments. So not exactly what we expected, uh, but you see that they are increasing over time, and they continue to increase even now, 10 years after the fire. Here I showing some of those, those trends over time with the non-native species. And uh, three of the more common non-natives were uh, cheatgrass, uh, Bromus tectorum, um, goat's beard, Trichopogon dubius, and bull thistle, Circea vulgari. So three real common uh, weedy species we see in these in forested environments. And for uh, cheatgrass, we went from, this is frequency now on the uh, y-axis, we went from finding it in about 4% of our quadrats in the beginning of the study in 2006 to finding it in over 50% of the quadrats in 2012. So it really spread. Um, this trichopogon, it also increased over time. At the same time, the bull thistle declined over time. And just so it doesn't look like it's all uh, gloom and doom with the cheatgrass, I was kind of following seeing this too, but uh, when you look at the actual cover of the plants, cheatgrass is still only about 4% covered. So it's, it's patchy, it's, it's abundant everywhere. I mean, it's, it's frequent, but it's not uh, dominating the uh, community by any means. Another two species are, are uh, very low and far less than 1% covered. So I, I thought it'd be fun to just to give you a little uh, time series from a photo point just to illustrate some of the changes that I've shown in the previous slides. Uh, this is, slide was taken in 2004 in one of the partially salvaged uh, treatment units. And this is one year after salvage. You can see a lot of bare ground, uh, a little bit of this prostrate CNO that's starting to grow here, uh, some Waithia mollus. Now 2006, uh, we got a little bull thistle coming in here. Uh, Prostrate so you know this has grown a bit. Uh, things are filling in a bit more. 2010, notice all the snags have fallen to the ground, or most of them. Uh, 
lot of the grasses have come in, and a lot of these grasses are native. And this has been in 2012. More of the snags are falling down. Uh, the vegetation is really growing in. So why did salvage affect uh, just the shrub community? This is my uh, chance to, um, to speculate a little bit. So a lot of the shrub component of this community were species that, are, that have fire simulated seeds that germinate immediately after the fire. They got one shot, basically. Uh, these are some Ceanothus seedlings. They're really tiny, and they're vulnerable uh, to any mechanical disturbance. And you can imagine if, if, uh, if some piece of machinery runs them over, uh, they're toast. And but a lot of the other native perennial species that tend to re-sprout from deeply buried plant parts. And apparently they were unaffected by uh, the salvage treatment. They were run over, but they kept on kicking. So um, just based on what we understand about how uh, non-native species respond to disturbance, I fully expected to see an effect of the salvage treatment on uh, non-native species. And the fact, sometimes when you, when you don't see what you expect, it causes you to look a little bit deeper, and it's a learning experience. Uh, in this case, we thought some, some more about the, the uh, conditions created by these two types of disturbances. The first disturbance was the wildfire, which uh, basically uh, removed 100% of the, uh, exposed 100% of, of the soil. It's all bare mineral soil, pretty much everything that was combustible was consumed. And then we had salvage, and this also, you can see, it disturbed the soil again. But if you have 100% of, of bare mineral soil, and you disturb 100% bare mineral soil, you still have 100% bare mineral soil. And so I'm, I'm thinking that the effect of salvage logging was possibly relatively small in, in, in comparison to the, to the uh, wildfire disturbance. And the same thing goes for the canopy. The canopy, you know, the, this open also opened up a lot of light environment. Uh, and certainly there's a little bit more light when you remove the snags, but not as much as removing the canopy itself. So um, one, one of the, another mechanism that's oftentimes of concern anytime you're involving uh, mechanical equipment is uh, that this equipment could be a conduit or a, or uh, for non-native species, uh, could be a vector to bring them into the into the site. Um, but the fact that we didn't see um, any difference with the salvage treatment uh, suggests that uh, mechanical harvest is likely not the primary mechanism by which these plants got in there. And when you think about it, um, the two two of the species, the trichopogon and, and the uh, cirsium are wind dispersed, and the other one, it could be dispersed by any number of means, cattle, dairy was grazed, uh, deer, small mammals, ants, uh, you name it. So just to kind of re reiterate um, some of our findings, um, in most of the understory dynamics we found to be not associated with salvage. Uh, only only uh, shrub cover was significantly affected. And in this case, a shrub cover went from about 40% in the unsalvaged treatment to about 23% uh, in the fully salvaged treatment. So it's, 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 uh, it, it definitely did not eliminate shrubs from it. Um, it's, it's a difference, but it's, it's pretty modest. Uh, we found that the non-natives had no effect. So, I mean, this, this invasion by non-native species is definitely a concern. We saw it still going up over time. We don't know what the end point's gonna be. Um, but it, my thinking is that uh, the conditions set up by the high severity fire were probably what um, is generating uh, this invasion by, by non-native species. So if there's an interest in reducing this threat of invasion, then um, it would be, you know, your best bang for the buck would be trying to uh, reduce the probability of ice and fire in the first place. And I just should add some caveats in that um, 
you know, just because of the findings that we saw doesn't mean that all salvage treatments you're going to see the same thing. There were some reasons to believe that uh, some of the things that happened here may have moderated the effect of salvage or some of the conditions on the ground. Uh, one being that we have rocky soil, we have, uh, it was done in very dry soil conditions, both of which reduced the, the probability of soil compaction. It's also a pretty minimal slope, and so less soil damage occurs under those situations. Uh, trees were pretty small, so it was a whole tree harvest, and we did, did a lot of large slash was left behind that would otherwise cover the understory vegetation. And so, um, lastly, I, I just thought I'd end with a, sort of a hopeful picture. Now, this is taken 10 years after the fire, nine years after salvage, and it's actually kind of pretty out there. I mean, there's a lot to see. Um, for a plant geek like me, there, there were a lot of, of just cool native species. And I think it just shows the, the capacity of ecosystems and our native species to uh, recover from disturbance. So it was, just, it was just nice to see this after 10 years. And I'd just like to acknowledge the people who helped it with this work. Uh, Last National Forest, the botanist, particularly Don Rudley, helped with uh, IDing species. Uh, a lot of uh, other folks from the Pacific Southwest Research Station uh, took the field data, and, and we got funding from the Joint Fire Science Program to, to carry this out. So thank you.